Those prototypes were made with Origami Studio. Let's learn a bit more about what that is and why it might matter to you. Hey, I'm Wayne, I'm a designer, and right now I'm a design lead at MetaLab, where I help make some cool products for interesting companies. Throughout my career, I've used a lot of different tools, but Origami Studio really stands out for me. Every time I've picked it up, it kind of surprises me. And recently, I've gotten really deep into it, and it's been such a great time. I've had such a good time with it that I'm making a tutorial series on how to use Origami Studio, but more on that later. For the rest of this video, I'm going to be talking about what Origami Studio is and why I think it's worth your time. So here are three aspects of Origami Studio that I think sets it apart from other tools. One way of mapping out tools like this to compare them is on a spectrum of interactivity. On one side of this, I would put Adobe After Effects. This is a good motion prototyping tool. It's an animation tool. And so it's based on timelines and keyframes. And you can do some really cool stuff with it, but it's going to be completely non-interactive. You're just going to watch videos of it. On the opposite side of this is where I think Origami Studio is. No timelines, no keyframes is a fully interactive prototyping tool. And that provides a lot of possibilities. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let's take a look at this prototype that I showed from the opening. This is going to be in one of the tutorials that's coming up. This is a prototype of a loyalty card. It has a bit of a visual effect like the Apple card. It uses a device motion to showcase a bit of a unique material shine to it, which is a nice fun trick. This prototype also uses the gyroscope to rotate the card a bit, which I think helps accentuate that material display too. But let's just look at the movement here. You can see in the camera feed that as I move the device, it is moving the card as well, which is great. There's nothing pre-canned about this. It's just happening as I move the device. Now, in a way, that's just another kind of user input. You could also in Figma wire a button to tap that, and then that's going to navigate you to another screen. And you know, the gyroscope could be just considered another form of input here. But let me point out something that is interesting in this kind of prototype. As I rotate the card off axes here, I'm going to stop moving my hand and the card is starting to return to its default position. Now I'm not doing any input at this point. So right now the card is just responding to itself. It is responding to behavior that I've implemented into the prototype. That opens a ton of doors. This is just scratching the surface of what that means. And we're going to go into more of that. But that means that this model of prototyping can get you way closer to how the working software is going to look and feel. In fact, in some cases, you can make it indistinguishable from the final working software. And that can be really important, not just as a designer working on this and iterating on this, but also when you want to push that into user testing as well. This is a very good thing. I'm going to explain more in the next section. So let's keep on moving. My primary design tool, Figma, is fantastic. I really love Figma, but it feels like it kind of treats our devices as screens and just screens. There are so many more things our devices can do. Mobile devices have haptic feedback. They can play sound. They have gyroscopes and accelerometers. They have multiple cameras, and they can fetch data via network requests. Figma doesn't give you access to any of those things. Sure, you can patch in some of that with plugins, but not very deeply. So when you don't have access to those things in your tooling, how are you supposed to iterate on that stuff and come up with ideas based on those features? Our tools influence our ideas positively and negatively. It's not enough to just know that these features exist. We have to be able to use them, experiment with them as well. And that's what can help fuel our imagination and create some more interesting, better new ideas. And as I mentioned before, not only is that going to benefit us directly, it's also going to help a ton in some cases with user testing. I have a really good story that I want to tell you right now about how Origami Studio was able to help us make a really good test with really great insights. A couple years ago at a different company, we were working on a project to create an app that was scanning receipts. So we had a bunch of physical props provided to us and we had designed a workflow that helped people line up their cameras and then if it met the sufficient criteria for that stuff, it would automatically capture the receipt if it was lined up, right perspective, right sense of scale and everything. So we need to test out this workflow. However, the problem was we didn't have any usable code. That stuff was being done in a parallel track and that wouldn't be available to us for probably one or two months at least, but we had to move on anyways. So we turned to Origami to make this work. So what we ended up with was a setup that looked like this. 
In our origami prototype, we had some tutorial cards that felt nice and realistic ahead of this, and then they would end up on the viewfinder, which we had been able to customize with our own overlays, some text guides, as well as a guide and shape to try and fit the receipt into. There's also connected to our laptops as well, so we could see what was happening on the devices from across the table, and the participants couldn't see our screen. So we gave them the physical prop receipt, and we asked them to follow the guidance and try and get that scanned in. It was mostly hands off. So as they lined things up with the receipt, we could see that happening. And now the prototype doesn't have the logic to distinguish that it is in the correct spot, but we could see that. So we could just trigger that on our laptops. We just hit the space bar and we advance the flow. It looked like it captured, it would do that flash, and then they would see the image that they had captured. Except they didn't capture an image. That was an image we had baked in a couple of days earlier from the same spot with the same receipts and same lighting and all that stuff. So to them, it just looked like it worked. So hopefully you can see that this was a scenario that really benefited from having a really realistic prototype. So if you've done some user testing with Figma in the past, you've probably done some varying levels of setup to get people to understand what they're getting into, how fake certain elements are, what they should be paying attention to, what they should be ignoring or not touching. Some of that's gonna be common to end user testing, but the more you know fake a prototype is, the more of that you have to do. And that feels like it gets in the way of the insights you're trying to reach with a test like this. In some cases, a more realistic prototype is going to get you better results and faster, despite a little bit more upfront investment in producing that. And that's why I think better access to device hardware can really help user testing and the entire product development flow. All right, here's the last aspect I wanna go over with why origami is different. And it is the interface. Or, no, I think that's actually selling it short. It's the entire interaction model of how Origami Studio works. Let's take a look at the interface so I can explain. This is what the Origami UI looks like. This is a prototype. This might look weird to you, and that wouldn't be surprising. This is what visual scripting looks like. Other terms might be thrown around, but I'm just going to stick with this one. When I first learned visual scripting back in, I think, 2014 with Quartz Composer, which was the predecessor to Origami Studio, no other tool did this. Nothing remotely mainstream anyways. Back then I wondered to myself, have I wasted my time learning something that will totally vanish in a couple of years? Did I learn the dead language equivalent of a prototyping tool? Fortunately, the answer to that is no. There are a bunch of other products these days that are using visual scripting. Let's go over some of them. First up, we have Little Big Planet 2 and Dreams. Both of these games are on the PlayStation platforms and are made by Media Molecule. So these are games that allow you to also make games within it. And you can do that with a controller. Their version of visual scripting is called circuit boards and I think microchips in dreams, but it's the same idea. You can do tons of different logic with this. Another example outside of games in, into creative tools is Blender. So Blender is 3D software for animation, modeling, rendering, all this good stuff. And also as part of that, you'd also be creating materials. This is the material node system within Blender. You can do a lot of complex things with this. You might start with a texture, transform it, do different operations to it, recolor it, whatever. And not only can you use this to just augment images that start with your textures and then transform them, you can ignore images completely and create completely procedural textures that are infinitely scalable and also really lightweight. Even though the use case is different, it's still the same idea. The last example I wanna go over is I think the most robust, Unreal Engine and its Blueprint system. It's a really mature, well-used, highly regarded system. You can make entire shipping games in this. The developers I know who use Unreal Engine also use the Blueprints in conjunction with normal programming. It's just that good and that useful. So to summarize, no, I don't think you'd be wasting your time. In fact, I think you'd be doing yourself a service to learn some of this. This stuff isn't going away anytime soon. And for what's worth, I think Origami Studio is a really good entry point to learn visual scripting as well. So those were the aspects in which I think Origami is different and unique in the landscape of prototyping tools. And while we've been talking about that, I think I've also touched on why it matters and why it's worth your time as well. But Let's summarize that and wrap this up. So I mentioned earlier how different tools opens up possibilities and also provides us different limitations as well. It boxes us in. Figma is a really good box to be within, it is a very powerful tool, a very deep tool, but it still has its limitations. Figma is really good at iterating on different layouts, creating design systems, and creating and testing out entire screen-to-screen -screen flows. That stuff is great and not going away. 
But all of that is still a box. It doesn't give you access to sensors. It doesn't give you the freedom to do more creative interactions as well. And yeah, origami is limited too, but in very different ways. In fact, I think one of the reasons I like origami is because Figma and origami feel like, to me, they complement each other really well. They do very different things and they don't overlap. And for me, there's something I really like about that when I think about my design toolbox of things that have specialized purposes and they don't overlap because that kind of feels wasteful to me. Since picking up origami again recently, I've been really energized to try new ideas. It's almost like I forgot that I could just try some really interesting, weird ideas because my tools didn't help facilitate that anymore. To me, I think that's the best reason to learn origami. It's gonna let you try new ideas, test them out, play with those ideas, things that you wouldn't necessarily have had before. This can bring more fun and interesting outcomes to your product design process. So that's my reasoning of why I think origami is worth your time. Let's wrap this up. Well, I hope I convinced some of you. I'm really enjoying using this tool and I think a lot of other people would enjoy using it too. As I mentioned earlier, to take this even further, I'm going to be making a tutorial series on origami, which is gonna be released over the coming weeks. We'll be going over some more unique off the wall ideas and how to make them. I'm specifically trying to think of things that you cannot make in Figma. I will not be going over the basics of the interface because I think the existing origami documentation already does a good job with that. However, if there is some demand for a primer on the UI, then I will definitely consider doing that too. So if you are interested in that stuff, please give me a like and subscribe. If you also, if you just like this video as well, uh, I'm still a really new YouTube channel. I'm trying to figure this stuff out. So I would really appreciate that and really appreciate any sharing in your networks as well. All right, that's it. Once again, I'm Wayne and uh, thank you for watching. Take care, see you soon.